Hi, welcome back to AstroArts. This program is produced by Astronomers Without Borders and CosmoQuest. My name is Daniela De Paulis, I'm the AstroArts Chair. And this evening I'm going to introduce you to our second speaker of our AstroArts program. His name is Jan van Malleik. Jan is a radio amateur, is part of the Cameras Radio Amateur Association at the Dwingelo Radio Telescope in the Netherlands and this evening is going to talk about the history of the radio telescope and the uh, current restoration that is bringing back this uh, important instrument to life for uh, research, also for uh, playful experiments by scientists and artists alike. Before I pass the uh, screen to Jan, I would like to remind you that you can uh, ask your questions, you can post them on the YouTube page where you are watching this uh, uh, program from. You can also post a question on the Google Hangout page or on uh, Twitter at hashtag GAM AstroArt. Enjoy the program and I will see you back later in a short while. Okay, thank you, Daniela. Good evening, G or good day, wherever you are. I'm just going to start my, uh, my talk. It will speak for itself. On April 17, 1956, the Dwingelo telescope was officially declared open by the Dutch Queen Juliana. On the picture, you see the proud father of the dish, Professor Oort, standing next to her. At that time, the Dwingelo radio telescope was the first 25-meter telescope in the world. The picture, this picture is taken on its 50th birthday in 2006, and that's why the Dutch flag is flying from the telescope. On the foundation of the telescope, we see this plate. Grote Reber was the first radio astronomer. He also was a ham radio operator. And he was the first who felt that the weak signals from space, which were discovered by Jansky, could be of interest for astronomers. To prove this, he built his own 10-meter dish in his backyard. Whether his wife approved, the story doesn't tell. As you can read on this plate, his ashes have been distributed to major radio observatories around the world. And the Dwingelo radio telescope is one of these. So we do our work nowadays literally on the foundation of uh, uh, Grote Reber. I, I always find that a fascinating thought. This is the Westerbork array. 14 telescopes, 25 meters in diameter. Astron, uh, the owners of this, built this instrument in 1970. And this is why the Dwingelo telescope slowly lost its function. Since 1997, all activities, professional activities in Dwingelo were stopped. Eight years later, things came together and the Cameras Foundation was founded. Our main objective is to restore and use the dish again. And Cameras stands for C.A. Muller Radio Astronomy Station. And Professor C.A. Muller, here you see a picture of him, worked at the dish for a very long time. He also was a ham radio op operator. His call sign is PA0CAM. And Lex Muller died in 2002. Another important man for the Dwingelo radio telescope is Professor Hugo van Woerden. Here we see him in the cabin of the telescope and Hugo is 86 years old now and he is an enthusiastic member of Cameras. He was a student of Professor Oort in 1956. Hugo was the first man to do astronom astronomical observations with the dish. He did an observation of 26 days with only two hours of sleep a day. When he tells about those first days, it sounds as it only happened yesterday and if he is 20 years old again. And Hugo is very pleased to know that the teles telescope uh, is saved for the future again. Now some words about the telescope itself. The dish and the cabin together weigh about 120,000 kilograms. This complete construction rotates. 
60 tons rest on the big two and a half central bearing which we see here and this is a closer look on the central bearing the other 60 tons are divided over four wheels which move on a rail here you see one wheel clamped on the rail this is done to prevent prevent the telescope tipping over during heavy winds you also can see the high-tech solution to keep the rail free from dirt ordinary brushes one of the first things we had to check was whether the wheels could still turn after 10 years of standstill so we just lifted the telescope a bit and tried to turn the wheel manually all four wheels appeared to be in excellent condition after 90 56 little was documented and every radio astronomer had his own ideas and added his own new devices without removing the old equipment this led to a lot of cables and coaxes most of them with no function anymore eventually we decided to strip the telescope of nearly all old, old cables we sold the removed cables and received more than 500 euros for copper and metals we have a very uh, free takeoff uh, this is the reason the telescope was built in Dwingelo on the verge of a, a, a natural reserve area when you go up the central piece of mesh can be removed and you can put your head in the center of the dish then you have a lovely view of 12 and a half meters stainless steel mesh in all directions the mesh itself is 7 by 7 millimeters the dish consists of triangular panels these panels are mounted on the supporting construction by means of what are, what, what are called mushrooms the mushrooms are adjustable and therefore play an important role in giving the dish its right shape when this stainless steel mesh was applied everything was adjusted within one millimeter tolerance some of those mushrooms were in a very corroded state restoring and readjusting all those mushrooms was a lot of work here we see one of the panels taken out for measurements one moment it will come it takes some time I see it already but it must appear on the main page too yes there it is and now I have some what I call dirty pictures of the dish here you can see what corrosion can do it goes without words yes it's really steel it's not wood <laughs> steel can look like this well and this is the the most bad one you see <laughs> so there was a lot of work to be done restoration of the construction could only be done by a specialized firm 
all the coating and corrosion had to be removed. Some parts had to be repaired or totally replaced, and after that the complete construction had to be coated again. It would take a few years to make the necessary preparations to get this job done. In 2006 the construction was inspected by a safety company and they declared it safe to use, so while funds were being raised, we still could go on with our efforts to get the dish going again. Well, where do you start? The first thing we did simply was cleaning, and we even used a vacuum cleaner. And we took a big high pressure cleaner and we had a lot of fun. And we were very happy with the result. It's white again. Below the green there was white. And here we see the machine room. At the, at the right we see the center of the construction. In the front and at the back we see two gearboxes. And those boxes are connected via torsion axles to minimize slack. The gray post on the left is the manual drive. The white motor next to it is the 3 kilowatt motor which was used to bring the dish in position quickly. The two blue motors, I have to wait, uh, no, there they are, you see them in the back, this, uh, there's another picture coming up, there it is. The two blue motors at the back were used for tracking. Those two motors, also 3 kW each, were coupled in an opposite direction, so most of the power was transferred into heat. By running one motor a little bit faster than the other, slow and accurate tracking was achieved. This was a very clever 1950 solution, but it made this room a very hot place. After the installation of these two motors in the 1950s, the small window above them has never been shut again. Now we have a closer look at the white motor for quick positioning, and we have also a good view of the brake system. Take some time. There it is. And this is before it was restored. And the next picture shows it after it was restored. And that's a big difference. The white motor has been painted green. And the only thing left inside is the axle. We will not use this motor for motorized movement anymore. But the axle is needed to keep manual movement possible. Also, the brake system is fully restored and painted green. And here we have another view on the motor. The white axle is the torsion coupling between the two gearboxes. And also the manual control is fixed again and painted gray. And this is how they did it. It's a lot of hard work. There was a lot of old grease and it all had to be removed. Pete and Peter working very hard. And here we have some nice details of the cogwheel. It survived the 50 years very, very well. It looks like new. And another detail of the cogwheel drive. And yet another one. They are magnificent and still in excellent condition. Here we have the new motors, very accurate servo motors from Germany. The two on the left are for elevation, and the big one on the right will do the azimuth. And here we see the azimuth motor in place, and the belt is ready to be mounted. Now we go up to the elevation. This is a view of the huge elevation system. Here we also see the counterweights. And here we see one of the elevation axles. And a closer view on one of the elevation axles. And a very big cogwheel for the movement of the dish in elevation. And an even closer look, and here we see already freshly applied grease. This is an Overview of the elevation area with the dish pointing upwards. And this is one of the elevation gearboxes ready for a refill. There it is. And here we go to refill it. And Pete opened the gearbox 
and you also see nice cogwheels. I have a detail of it. There it is. And I have a look inside. Also, those wheels look like new, but yet they are 50 years old. Elevation is also possible manually. Of course, this can only be, be done with two people, one for each gearbox. One of the two elevation motors installed. Now we go down again. And the new motors are computer controlled. To make that work, a lot of electronics is needed. The board on the picture was a donation. Only a few of the components you see here could, could be reused. And here we see Cor. Yes, there he is, working on the electronics. And he is making big progress. The blue boxes are the controllers for the new motors. And this is the board just before it went back in the cupboard again. And here we see the, uh, the, the board back in place again. And here a closer look. And this is how it looks, ready for testing. Now, this was the first test. You see those guys looking close to see if the wheel moves. And it did. It worked. The telescope is alive again after 10 years of standstill. Hooray! And I tried it manually, myself. <laughs> and when you do this, you see in the, con uh, in the control room inside, the, 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 the meter move by a thousandth of a degree. More, I cannot push it, but it's 120 tons, so that's only logical. But you can move it a little, only a very little. And also the elevation runs smoothly. Here you see it going up again. So we were very happy when this happened. The movement of the dish also attracts uh, tourists. Oh, I see I have some slack. One, wait a moment. Yeah, there they are. You see here uh, tourists looking. There, uh, there is a, a bicycle path nearby, and people stop all the time and look at the big thing. And this is how the tourists see the dish from a distance. People like to stop and ask questions, and we like to tell our stories, and we have very good reasons for that. Because the Camras Foundation needs donations. So every contact with the public is a chance to raise some money to be used to preserve the instrument. And here, where it is, there it comes. Here you see me in action explaining the wonders of the telescope to a very young public. So, in 2008, the dish moved again. That was great, but to use it, we also need new a new antenna in focus. Now we go a bit back in time and tell the story of the feed and the focus box. What kind of antenna was used by the radio astronomers? And here it is. A nice feed horn for 40, 20 megahertz, mounted on a big and heavy dewer to keep the front end very cold. Here we see Cor, Jan and Piet preparing the feed for this last journey to the Astron Museum. And here we see it going out. Easy does it. The heavy feet was mounted in the focus box. Therefore, the telescope has a four-legged construction for the focus box and also a lot of counterweights. And here you see it going down in the car and we have touchdown. What should be our first new feet? The telescope was built for 21 centimeters, the hydrogen line. And there was a lot of interest to do amateur radio with the dish. So it was only logical to start on 23 centimeters. That's the nearest amateur radio wavelength. A well-known design in the amateur radio world is the combined 70 centimeter, 23 centimeter feet by Doug McCarter, VK3UM, a guy from Australia. And it was a nice idea to have uh, two bands available. So this feed was built. And the antenna was built by radio amateurs, and when it was ready, it was transported to Dwingelo like this. People must have thought there was a, a rocket car on the road. And this is the front view of the feet and the 70 centimeter dipoles. The feet is closed with EPS to prevent insects and or birds to use it as a home. And that works very well. Okay, let's see. We have a moving dish. 
we have a 23 centimeter 70 centimeter feet but how do we get the feet up there the focal box is 15 meters over the ground well it's pretty easy oh wrong side wrong page it's easy we take the elevator wait for the picture it should come yes there it is <clears throat> we have an elevator in the past Astron had to transport all kinds of heavy cryogenic feed systems to the focal box so they bought this elevator system and modified it to make it work from the telescope for the telescope these things are originally made for mobile inspection of high buildings the elevator in docking position one moment one moment it takes some time yes here we see the elevator in docking position it is possible to move the feet in and out uh, focus while it's in the focus box this is done by the small motor you see on the left the small thing between the two curved lines it looks easy but a lot of work had to be done to make this work again let me take you back to our first ride up to the focus box if you are in the elevator and you go, go up you see this and it, it's coming close and then after a few moments you see this there it is and then you remove the cover and then you see that a lot of work has to be done it was not possible to access all sides of the focal box using the elevator the focus motor was not working anymore so it had to be removed how do we do that well we found someone with mountain climbing gear and experience and he took the focus motor out here you see him doing that this is a nice view on the supporting construction of the dish well I tell you something about the restoration of the focus box the focus motor and all the mechanical stuff in the focus box were fabulously restored by Pete the motor however appeared to be too heavy so we could not use the mountain climbing technique to put it back in place we also had to mount new coax cables and therefore we also needed to work on high altitude and because our feeds will be much much lighter than the cryogenic astron feeds we decided to take out some of the counterweights to bring the telescope better in balance for all this work we needed a sky lift we rented this fine piece of equipment for one week it became one of the busiest weeks we experienced at the telescope this was a great occasion to access a lot of difficult places so while we were at work we got all kinds of new ideas to use the sky lift Pete who lives, lives nearby sometimes started working at 6 o'clock in the morning one week appeared to be too short and we were lucky to have the lift for a few days extra be, for free because we were there were no other customers at that time so and it, it looked very nice let me see I'll push this button and there we have the next picture it was a very flexible sky lift we could access real difficult places in a very nice way well then the coax cables had to go up and here you see that's being done that's so that, that are cables that transport our radio signals up and down there he climbs up to mount the cables and he is taping them together to lead them through one of the four feed support poles those are hollow so the, the, the easy that's the easiest way to to get the cables up and here's here he is on yes here he goes there they go up and here we see Pete working in the focus box the box is big enough for two people to sit in so big enough for all our gear and here we have the restored focus motor ready to go up again with the skylift and Pete is mounting the focus motor at high altitude and here the motor is in place again on the right you see a worn out cable protection hose and here you see new cable protection hoses that was very much needed and here you see the position 
uh, the, the, the situation of two houses replaced, the green ones, and the black one is an, is an old one yet. Um, here you can see that a uh, few counterweights are removed, the round things um, about in the middle of the, uh, of the picture. You see two are left and the others are gone. And those counterweights are here on the ground and every counterweight weighs 30 kilo kilograms. So, we have a moving dish, a dual band feed, a restored focus motor, and a focus box, and new cables. Time to put the feed in focus. There we go. To transport the frame with the feed to the focus box and put it in place, it has to be mounted on this little lorry. And on the next picture, we see Harke, Piet and Dick mounting the feed on the lorry. And the lorry with the feed and the antenna and the an antenna frame are here in the elevator. And there she goes up. And a, a few moments later, we see that the feed is in place. So, we are more or less ready. Time to install some equipment. Here we see Radio Amateur Ene in 2008 during the May 10 and 11 Moon Radio Contest. This was the first time we did Earth, Moon, Earth radio contacts with the dish. During the very first try, I was at home observing the signals transmitted by the Dwingelo dish and reflected by the moon. On the picture you see, you see my homebrew 3 meter dish I used for that. On the right you see a screen with white lines. Those lines are the signals I received from the moon. It's the first contact of the Dwingelo dish via the moon. The contact was done in Morse code and the other station was a radio amateur from Belgium using a 6 meter dish. Moon tracking was a bit of a problem yet. We managed, more or less, but we needed a lot of computers. Here we see Jeroen struggling with four computers. And we have the radio station in action. You see Dick, the radio op operator, he's very good at Morse code and he's smiling, so he's having a lot of fun making all the contacts via the moon. And we had great weather, so the dish looked fantastic. But we also did this. Paul Boven, our uh, astronomer, uh, did drift scans and he looked at uh, Cassiopeia Alpha, Cygnus Alpha and Taurus Alpha to see the, the, the energy we received and it was pretty much on target. So that was very nice. The first uh, radio astronomy measurements with the more or less restored dish. And Paul also did um, uh, 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 he looked at the beam width of the of the, the dish and that was also okay 0.64 degrees just about right for a 25 meter dish on 23 centimeters while we were measuring sun noise you can see that only the opening of the feed lights up as an extra confirmation that we were definitely in focus of course, of course, the dish is not an optical instrument, but the stainless steel mesh reflects just, just enough sunlight to get this result. When you look closely at the focus, you see the little white dot, and that's where the sun beams are uh, converged. So, in 2008, we had the old dish up and running again, capable of doing radio astronomy and capable to do EME. But the big work was yet to come. To do a full restoration, the dish had to be lifted from its pedestal. All corrosion had to be removed, some parts had to be renewed, and all had to be coated again. So on April 28, 2012, all operations stopped to start this big job. We had some highlights uh, during uh, um, um, th those four, first four years, and before I will tell you all about the big restoration, it's a good moment to look back a bit at those four years. We did a lot of EME and we also had a lot of other things. I will say a few words about those subjects, but the time of this presentation is too short to go in depth on all of them. Um, well, we did 1,543 EME contacts and, well, that's, that's really a lot. Uh, um, but because we are al al already used a lot of time, um, maybe these subjects are in a, uh, good for a next uh, try, so I will go to the, to the next uh, slide, otherwise we 
we used too much time. But we did really a lot in those four years. And to demonstrate the echo we get from the moon, I have this small movie. I have to do something with my microphone, and then I will start uh, this small movie. So you, you hear me, my, me singing my favorite moon song uh, together with the moon. I sing and I hear uh, my echo uh, back from the moon in two, two and a half seconds. There we go. Well, this is a very powerful way to demonstrate how moon bounce works. Another thing we did, uh, um, and uh, you can see Daniela down in the screen. This is this is the idea of Daniela uh, to do uh, image bounce. I won't go into details because that will take too long. But here you see the result of a bounced image, and uh, Howard Ling from England sent this uh, uh, picture to the moon, and we received it back. And of course, you recognize our famous Dutch astronaut Andre Kuipers. And uh, Daniela uh, has a whole art thing that's called optics about, and when you uh, look on the internet and you look for optics and Daniela de Paulis, you can learn all about it. We also sent a message to Kronos. Uh, I, I just give you the YouTube link. It's an eight minute uh, movie, too long for now. But if you uh, search on uh, Google and you, you su uh, search for uh, message to Kronos and Dwingelo, you will find it, or you can copy this link. And then um, it, it, that also was a crazy art project, but we really uh, sent a voice message to the Klingon homeworld <laughs> to invite them for the premiere of a real Klingon opera. So I won't go into detail, otherwise it take too long. Well, now I go um, a week by week picture show about the big restoration of the dish. Week 22 in 2012. You will see uh, it started, and it started with the remo removing of the focal box. And that was, of course, leg by leg. You see the first uh, leg being removed, and there it goes. Here it goes down. And here it is down, and you see we can visually inspect it. One down, three to go. Leg number two. A few moments before touchdown. Two down, two to go. Leg number three coming down. Struggling with the last one, that's of course always the most difficult, but it worked, and here we have the focus box flying free. And down on the ground, you only see how big it is, nearly as high as the fence. Plenty of room for our preamps. And this was the cause of the struggle. Brute force was necessary to get those loose, very corroded bolts. Here you, you we see the completely dismantled operating room. And it was very, very empty. Nice detail. The exact, exactly the same four concrete blocks as on which the telescope was built are being used for the temporary pedestal. The, they only had to clear the terrain of plants and bushes. The reuse of the old foundation gives the res restoration an extra historic touch. And here you see a close-up of one of those four blocks. This is the pedestal just next to the telescope on the four concrete blocks. On this construction, the dish was for about five months to be restored completely. Another view of the temporary pedestal. And the dish without the focus box and without the four legs, ready to make the short ride down to its temporary pedestal only a short distance, but short isn't always easy. When week 23, the lifting of the dish. On June 5, 2012, 
1400 local time, the dish was supposed to be lifted from its pedestal for the first, first time since 1956. My wife and I arrived around 12.30 to, be, to experience some of the preparation. When we arrived, the, the 500 ton crane was already fully rigged and apparently ready to lift the dish. So we thought it would become a short show of something like 15 minutes. How wrong we were. The weather was fine, hardly any wind, nice temperature. People were gathering to watch the show. A busy touristical bicycle path is very close to the dish, so many tourists stopped to witness the historical event. National TV, national radio, national newspapers and many local media were present to tell the story to the world. The big crane was ready to pull, and it's a very, very strong crane. The lifting chains were also ready and about one hour before the lift-off and tourists were already gathering. This is a nice view from a distance, how it looked that day with bright weather. And this is a few moments before lift-off, we thought. The cameraman and the reporter from Dutch National TV are going up for an interview with a nice perspective. Here they go up ready for some nice shots and this is what they saw very nice view from above and also a nice view from the temporary pedestal and this is where the nuts and bolts will go and this is a nice view in the direction southeast over our uh, national reserve area this is the Astron buildings from above. Uh, a new wing is being added to the building. There it is. It took very long to get a building permit because it's so close to the natural reserve area. And in this place, more than 200 scientists from all over the world are working on radio astronomy. Well, the people, were, of course, were getting curious. Why does it take so long? And we were all waiting for things to come. And here we have a distant view. There we are. And action at last. Workers are going up to unscrew the last few nuts and bolts. More and more people are watching. The pulling has started. The 500 tons crane is rigged to lift 40 tons. The contractor estimated the weight of the dish at 30 tons maximum. So we have 10 tons margin. That should be enough. The crane is roaring. The workers are hammering. But no movement yet. The public is waiting and discussing why it took so long. The crane is pulling 40 tons now. More is not possible in this configuration. The workers are checking the nuts and the bolts. Yes, they are all loose. There even is some movement, but the dish goes not, does not go up. Apparently the dish weighs more than 50 tons. The pulling is stopped. Extra counterweights are ordered. An extra crane is ordered for lifting the counterweights and the whole operation is postponed by about 5 hours. Radio and TV reporters bring the news and it seems we have a real cliffhanger. A few hours later, a truck with the extra counterweight rushes towards the waiting crane. And the big crane had to be fully down to, rigged, to be rigged for pulling 60 tons maximum. The extra crane for lifting counterweights is behind the big crane. Extra counterweights are being added. Watch your fingers and your toes. And look at those cables. Oh, another one. I mean this one. Look at those cables. They are very, very thick. It's, it's a very, very big gear. And this is only the hook. There it is. One moment. There it is. Only the hook. <laughs> very big one. And here the completely the head of the crane, also impressive construction. And this extra part is needed to reinforce the crane. One moment, there it is. And everything is big on this crane. And this is the guy who runs the show, and of course ever, everybody envied him. And here the reinforcement slowly getting in shape. I'll go quick through those pictures. It's impressive. It goes up slowly and up and up. 
And now the crane moves out and out and further out. And the lifting boom is being prepared. And there it goes up. And now it's moved to the dish. And all is connected again. And workers in skylifts are mounting the lifting chains. Five hours have passed. It's eight o'clock in the evening. Radio and TV guys are still present. Time for the second try. The old lady does not give way. A lot of hammering is needed to make her free. Yes, the dish has moved up a few centimeters. And then I start a movie. There we go. This is a time-lapse movie. There we go. Let's see how that works on the screen. I think it will be a bit jumpy, but anyway, you see what happens. And at last, after all this waiting, the dish is free of its pedestal for the first time since 1956. And for a few seconds, a flying saucer can be spotted in Dwingelo. The second try took about one hour. Finally, the dish gave way at 43 tons of pulling force. And when it was free flying in the air, the dish weighed 37 and a half tons. Now, you see in this movie, it is, takes about uh, three minutes. Um, it's a time-lapse movie. One picture is one second, uh, so it goes very fast. Uh, so it's three minutes uh, in about, uh, about, I mean, the, the other way around. It's about one hour in three minutes. Um, and you see, some t you see the flag moving, and you see the dish is rocking a little bit up and down. And at the end, it finally uh, comes loose, goes up in the air, and goes there. Here, you see it moving a little bit. I don't know if you can see that all but because of the, the quality of the internet link maybe it's a little bit jumpy but at the end you will see the dish going up and going down again after the big dark cloud the sky clears and that's more or less a sign <laughs> probably for the dish to give way and go up that should be about now You see people uh, moving up and down there. We see some movement. There it goes up. It has been there for more than 50 years. Never been down again. This is the first time it flies again. Big movements. And there we go. Yes, it really moves. Up, up, up. And there it comes. And there it goes down. Well, to save some time, I will go to the next slide. And here we see... Um, that it, we only need a few meters and the guys are mounting it on the pedestal here we have only a few centimeters to go nearly there and it's in position and it can be it's bolted down now safe and secure and we have an empty main pedestal that was a little bit too quick but that's the way it is. <laughs> and the mission... Oh no, no, I was not too quick. There it is. This is the empty main pedestal. And the mission is accomplished so far. Next week, there we go. Um, to be able to access every inch of the dish, a huge building of scaffolding has to be constructed. And with such a big dish, dish of course, that is really very, very big. Well, those pictures talk for themselves, I think. Speak for themselves. So 
Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the scaffolding reached the top and the structures on the ground are parts of the roof. So now they built the roof. And that was done in week 25, building the roof and the mesh was removed. The roof is constructed on the ground and then lifted at the top. First these are mounted and later other roof plates will be fitted in. And it's really a huge building. And so it's closed. The pedestal is in scaffolds now too. This is a view under the roof. And here we have a more distant view. That's the way the tourist will see it during the next months. And here we see the mushrooms and how bad the quality of the mushrooms was. Here the panels are removed and all the mesh panels are labeled and stored in a vertical position in three containers. In week 26 we're going to do this. High above the dish a laser measurement device was set up and by putting the laser reflector on every mushroom position the coordinates of every mushroom are stored into the memory of the machine. This will be a great help when the new mushrooms are adjusted. We will see that later. And here the last few mesh panels are to be taken out. The frame of the dish with no mesh anymore. Some heavy de uh, corroded details. And yes, restoration was really necessary. And here we see another bad spot. And one of the three containers filled with the mesh panels. Removing the mushrooms. There it goes. And there goes another one. And the, this one is so bad, you can nearly remove it by pushing it. And in the meantime, the scaffolding at the pedestal is nearly at its highest point. Oh, that was a little bit quick, but it speaks for itself. And here you see the heavily corroded dish fixing point. The two elevation gearbox also need some maintenance and because they are a bit in the way for the blasting, they have to come down. The preparations for lifting, the first gearbox are being made. And it goes carefully up. And there it goes. Flying high and going down. And now it's safely down. And gearbox, gearbox number two is coming out. And now they are both down. In week 27 the tent was completed and the bed bolts were replaced. White plastic acts as a wall and this is to keep the dust inside. The blasting will cause a lot of dust. When bed bolts are found they are replaced. Simply as that. And here you see some bolts that are good enough and some that are replaced. And in week 28 we did, or we did, they did, the professional company did the blasting. They used huge compressors, uh, pressurized, pressurized air control, an air treatment installation. And because of the blasting the tent is now firmly closed to keep all the dust in. That's a tough job to, tough job to close every hole. And inside the tent, a few seconds before the blasting starts, and as soon as the blasting starts, there is dust everywhere. It's a very, very dusty job. It also makes a lot of noise. And when the dust has settled, you can see what has come off. It's more or less 56 years of coating history. In week 29, we see the first blasting results and we could inspect the mesh. Blasting is a messy and noisy business, 
But look at the result. Some parts look like new. But on other parts you can clearly see how deep the corrosion has gone. And that's really, really deep in some places. Some parts look great. But other parts definitely need to be repaired. And this is an example of a nice new mushroom construction. They were all taken out and constructed like this way. In this, in this way. And in the meantime, several cameras volunteers started to work on the stainless steel mesh panels. Every panel is inspected and small repairs are done and panels that needed big repairs are put aside. There are 350 panels, so this will take a while. In week 13 we see more blasting result and more mesh cleaning. We have great blasting results of the counterweight session of the counterweight session of the dish. And here we are admiring the result. The big elevation cogwheel also looking very good. And here you have the distant view, how the tourist saw the tent. And here it's a bit closer. Week 30 was a week with very nice weather. So an ex excellent week to clean the mesh with high pressure water. Playing with water is always fun. And everyone gets a go. Um, brushing is also a very effective technique. And here we see the clean team. And of course, they also sometimes have a break. In week 31, the new coating was applied. The pedestal is completely blasted clean and the first layers of coating are already applied. The top of the pedestal beautifully cleaned and another part of the clean top and part of the pedestal. And this is one of the fixing, spo fixing points for the dish as good as new. Cleaned, repaired and coated. The counterweight section of the dish also with the first layer of coating. That is this one. And the elevation cogwheel with the first layer of coating. And the greasy part of course is being protected. And these are, this is a detail of the construction in the elevation axle. And another beautiful detail like new again. The frame of the dish fully repaired and with the first layer of coating. Extra attention is given to the mushrooms. They get an extra layer of paint manually. All layers are applied here. And here we see a new mushroom construction. All mushrooms are put back into position carefully. The laser uh, gear. And the cabin also gets a new roof. Here we see the mushroom in action. Mesh panels are put back into place. And after this was completed, the dish was put back on the tower again. This was done in November 19, uh, 2012. It was a bit foggy day, but it was actually an advantage. There was no wind whatsoever, so it was a relatively easy job. A movie of the mounting of the dish can be found on the camera's website. It's more or less the other way around is the movie I showed you, so I thought I'd keep it uh, for shortness for pi only pictures. And here, millimeter by millimeter, the fully restored dish was lowered and at the end safely landed on the tower again. And after, dish, after the dish was put on the tower again, the volunteers of cameras had to restore the focus box. Here we see the antenna box freshly painted and looking like new again. This is the complete focus box, also freshly painted and ready for transportation to Dwingelo again. And that's how the situation is now, at this moment. Next week, this box and the four legs will be mounted on the dish again. After that, it will still take several months before all systems will be up and running again. But we are moving forward and we hope to be ready before summer. And we hope the fully restored dish will be ready for another 50 years of service. So let's hope for a bright future of the restored dish. And the last picture is coming now. And I think well, it takes some time, but it should be here. I was trying, yes, that, and now I see it. I hope you see it all. So thank you. It took a, a, a little bit more time than <laughs> I thought, but anyway, here we are. Uh,
this it this uh, this it is. Are there any questions? Okay, thanks Jan for the presentation about this wonderful instrument. We could see the passion you have for uh, uh, the Zwingelo radio telescope and uh, air, uh, ham radio activities. I, uh, I really appreciated to see the teamwork that goes into uh, the restoration and uh, keeping this dish into life. So. It's, it's really wonderful. Yeah. Um, we have um, a comment from uh, Wolfgang Dunker on Google Plus and uh, he says, excellent, a far cry from the Pony dual 10 feet dishes at the Mars Observatory. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. thank you. <laughs> do you know the observatory mentioned in uh, this question, I mean in this comment, Mars Observatory, uh, but we'll, I will check it out. Okay. But uh, I would like to also point out that this instrument, uh, well, it's already kind of well known by the Astronomers Without Borders community. Uh, we've done some performances last year, the year before, thanks to this instrument. But it's really unique. Uh, the reason why it's really worth it to see uh, the restoration of this instrument is uh, important not only because it's a very interesting documentation about the work that goes into the maintenance of these important scientific instruments, but also because the Dwingler radio telescope is a very special radio telescope. Um, is used is probably the only instrument of this kind in the world that is used not only for scientific purposes but also for uh, purely experiment, experimental reasons like art and uh, ham radio activities. Maybe you would like to say something ab about this uh, unique aspect of the of the dish. Oh, oh yes, <laughs> I can. Well, we, we we do. As you said, we are the only uh, 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 antenna so far that that is more or less one hundred percent usable. Uh, by uh, by radio amateurs or by artists, so uh, we can do uh, Earth Moon Earth uh, with it with it more or less whenever we like. So that that gives us very very big opportunities. Uh, and the art project, as yourself uh, uh, have conducted, that's it's also a, a very inspiring instrument uh, uh, to do uh, all kinds of, of of as you said playful or artistic uh, things and the, the availability of the instrument is is extraordinary extraordinary there have been uh, big dishes in action for amateur or uh, uh, art projects but m most of the time those were dishes that were still in use and could be used for a weekend or a week or whatever but this thing is here for uh, well, for, and now especially for 50 years uh, to be used by uh, amateurs, artists, and whatever. So that's indeed, as you say, a real unique situation. Okay, and also for scientific reasons, but not the mainstream scientific, um, not mainstream radio astronomy. Indeed. <laughs> okay, Jan, thanks so much. Uh, if I'm sure your video is going to be recorded and uh, posted on YouTube so people can keep watching and uh, posting comments or questions on YouTube. Maybe we'll be able to uh, wire them to Jan so he can reply. Thanks everyone for watching. Uh, thanks Jan for the wonderful presentation and I would like to remind you that uh, this uh, event was part of uh, the AstroArt program. The next uh, live event of the AstroArt program will be on the 12th of April 2013 as part of the Global Astronomy Month. Uh, will be a film screening. Uh, the film is called Overview by the Planetary Collective. So in the meantime, have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world and I will see you soon. Bye. Goodbye everybody.